Welcome to the fourth uh, in an occasional series of webinars sponsored by the alumni relations and development people here at the University of Chicago. My name is Al Telser. I'm a member of the class, college class of 1961. Two of my classmates and I, Roberta Jacobson and Howard Zarr, have been organizing these events for the last four years or so. Uh, this year, our efforts were supported by Jamie Becca in the, the uh, in ARD alumni development, ARD alumni relations and development. Our guiding principle in choosing topics and speakers for these webinars has been to identify areas where we, particularly the three of us, um, think about the cutting edge research that we know about and that we would like to know a little more about. Uh, particularly, of course, being done by a member of the faculty here at the University of Chicago. Today's speaker, Professor Catherine Nagler, PhD, the Bunning Food Allergy Professor in the Departments of Pathology and Medicine, aptly fits that description. Professor Nagler received her BA from Barnard College and both a Master's and PhD in Immunology from New York University. She was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Cancer Research at MIT and served on the faculty of Harvard Medical School before she came here to the university. She's been at the University of Chicago since 2009. Her work is published in major research journals. That means the high profile journals like Science and Nature, or those of you who know things like that. Um, she has been widely recognized for her work for quite some time, but in particularly the work that she's been doing for the last few years. Um, she, she's, her work has been recognized not only in the scholarly world, but by the general media. She's been written up in Time Magazine, um, had TV stations come and talk to her about things like that. Uh, she'll, you'll hear more about her work today. Her current research is devoted to understanding how the immune system interacts with the intestinal microbiome. We will have a glossary in your hands in a short time if you haven't had a chance to see it. Um, such that this intestinal microbiome, now considered by many to actually be an organ of the body, such that some individuals f develop food allergies or diseases like uh, er inflammatory bowel disease, while others of us do not. We all eat the same thing. Some of us have problems, some of us don't. Uh, this all seems to be related to the microbiome. If you are not familiar with the uh, human microbiome, I think you will find what she tells us about it today to be fascinating. Uh, we did distribute yesterday afternoon or morning by uh, email a, set, a, a place to look up materials including the glossary and a number of links to references that you may find interesting. If you've not had a chance to see those, you may want to go back and look at them when you get home because they're actually quite interesting. And that went um, yesterday? Sorry? Last week. It, it, it was, was an week. email yesterday. No, it was last week, too. There was one yesterday. Well, it, well maybe we can talk about this afterwards. Don't you have copies of something today? We will have a copy of the glossary arriving hot off the press. So Super. hang on. Um, and the other thing I would bring to your attention is a book called Missing Microbes that was in the list of references yesterday. Uh, this is a book that Professor Nagler has actually bought a number of copies of and gives to friends if they want to know more about the kind of work she does. It's really quite good. Um, she has held many positions in professional societies. She's been an editor for a number of journals, primarily immunology journals, received a large number of grants from the NIH and other sources, and has been on many committees and boards, or, as well as uh, study sections for the National Institutes of Health. Her most recent work has attracted a great deal of attention so that many people want to see and hear her and meet her. Uh, today we are fortunate to be able to hear and meet her ourselves. So with that, I'll have Professor Nagler begin her talk. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Are all of the mics working appropriately? So it, it's really an honor to be here to speak to you. I just uh, gathered from the conversations I heard at, at the lunch tables that this is a very sophisticated crowd. I was wondering exactly how to, to pitch the talk. So I want to show you a little bit of our data and also explain a lot of, of 
I, don't, I hope you won't need to refer to the glossary by the time I'm done. If you have questions that come up as I'm going along, please feel free to ask them. And also, we will have more times for questions at the end. So I would bet that none of you have food allergies, but your grandchildren have, have many food allergies. And in fact, it's become food allergies have, have reached an epidemic proportion in the United States. So it's now um, estimated that 15 million Americans have uh, food allergies. And most allergic responses to food can be traced to the eight foods um, that are shown here. So milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, soy, wheat, fish, and shellfish. Allergic responses to milk, eggs, soy, and wheat are typically transient and outgrown by the age of five, so they appear between ages two and five. But peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish are associated with lifelong and life-threatening allergic responses. We don't know why these eight foods are the champion food allergens. We don't know why we have these two seemingly separate diseases, one that's lifelong and life-threatening, and one that resolves on its own. And, but we do know what the major allergens are, and they've been studied intensively to look at what about their biochemistry might explain this. Reactions to a food allergen can range from, from a mild response, urticaria or hives, to anaphylaxis, which is a, a life-threatening a potentially deadly reaction. And this summary, which was provided by Food Allergy Research and Education, um, estimates that every three minutes in the US, uh, someone goes to the emergency room for an allergic response to a food. And it now affects one in 13 children, so that's two children in every classroom. So I thought I would start with a video that I got from the NIH website that explains what a food allergic reaction is. During an allergic reaction, the immune system responds to a normally harmless substance as if it were a threat. In some people, common foods such as milk, eggs, and peanuts can trigger such a reaction. So how does this work? If you have a food allergy, your immune system makes a type of antibody called immunoglobulin E, or IgE. This class of antibody binds to immune cells called mast cells and basophils that circulate throughout your body. When you are exposed to the food allergen, it attaches to the IgE antibodies. This binding signals the immune cells to release histamine and other chemicals that cause allergy symptoms, such as swelling of the lips, hives, and shortness of breath. Because mast cells and basophils rapidly release these chemicals, an allergic reaction typically occurs within 30 minutes after exposure. The most severe kind of reaction is called anaphylaxis, which can cause a sudden drop in blood pressure, trouble breathing, dizziness, and possibly death. People with food allergy and poorly controlled asthma are more susceptible to severe reactions. An anaphylactic episode must be treated with a hormone called epinephrine, which maintains blood pressure and opens up the airways. To deal with accidental exposure, people diagnosed with food allergy are prescribed a medical device called an auto-injector that delivers a single dose of epinephrine into the thigh muscle. Antihistamines alone are not an effective treatment for anaphylaxis. There is no cure for food allergy. The best way to manage the condition is to avoid the allergenic food, read food labels carefully, wash hands and household surfaces, and always carry an epinephrine auto-injector. If you are accidentally exposed to a food allergen, seek medical help immediately. The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, or NIAID, conducts and supports research to better understand, prevent, and treat food allergy. In 2010, an expert panel sponsored by NIAID issued guidelines to assist healthcare professionals in diagnosing and managing the disease. These guidelines and a summary for patients, families, and caregivers can be found on the NIAID website. Question. Oh. That 50% increase, is. do we know how much of that is real and how much is just better discovery and ascertainment? So um, that question always comes up in professional meetings. And it was initially a little bit controversial because some of it was based on phone surveys. And I showed this video intentionally to make 
clear what a food allergy is. So we're talking about IgE-mediated responses to food. There are other types of responses to food. So for example, lactose intolerance is not a food allergy. Mm -hmm. So those early questionnaires were controversial because they were reported by the patients. The most recent estimate of, of a 50% increase came from a study sponsored by the Centers for Disease Control, which was based on hospitalizations for food allergy. So I think those numbers are reliable, and we have a, a real increase. And I can tell you that I've seen it. So my kids are, are, are 23 and 18, and I've seen the increase in the epidemic over the course of their lifetimes. So when my kids were first starting school, it was just starting, the prevalence was just starting to increase. Peanuts were starting to be removed from the classrooms. By the time my children graduated high school, my younger child, her, her, all of her events were peanut free because there was an increasing number of kids. And the exposure can be minimal. There's even reports of severely allergic children being on a plane where somebody several rows behind them opens a bag of peanuts and the aerosolization of that tiny bit of, of peanut crumbs is enough to trigger a reaction. So it's a big, big safety problem for, for the people that have this kind of severe response. And food allergy presents with a, with a number of other similar diseases in a, in a pattern that's called the atopic or the allergic march. So people who are atopic, genetically susceptible to allergic disease, present first as infants with a skin rash called atopic <coughs> dermatitis. As I told you, food allergy typically appears maximally between the ages of two and four with greater introduction to solid foods and then wanes. Um, some of the re allergic responses wane, but others continue into adulthood. And then allergic rhinitis and asthma start to appear at around school age. Oral tolerance is the mechanism, the immunological mechanism by which the body maintains non-responsiveness to food. So it's why we're not all food allergic, because all of the foods we eat could potentially be antigens. So my, que my research questions are, and the topic of this um, seminar today, why is the induction of tolerance to food failing in patients with food allergies, and what's driving this marked generational increase? So we turned our attention to the microbiome. Um, it's increasingly clear that the, that the bacteria, we're going to talk about bacteria, but um, remember that the microbiome also includes viruses, bacteriophages, other microbes that are less, even less well characterized than the bacteria we're just beginning to learn about. But we know, um, mostly from work in the last 10 years, that these bacteria that live on and in us outnumber the cells of our body by 10 to 100 to 1. And their genetic capabilities are enormous. So we have 20,000 genes encoded by 10 trillion human cells but 100 trillion bacterial cells in and out in our bodies that encode 20 million genes. So their capacity for regulating our physiology is enormous. And to give you a, a feeling for what these numbers mean, E. coli is a bacteria in the gut that you hear a lot about. There are as many E. coli in each of our intestines as there are people on Earth. So, so it's an enormous number. And we live in a dynamic interrelationship with these bacteria. We have to tolerate them. We don't, most of us don't make a response against the bacteria, and the bacteria don't cause a pathogenic response to us. But we're always receiving signals from them. And these bacteria, as I've, I've told you, have confer many health benefits to the host. So for example, there are vitamins that are essential for our health that we can't make, that these bacteria make for us. So vitamin K is an example. Most of the insoluble fibers in plants, we can't digest on our own. These bacteria do it for us. And we'll talk a lot about the implications of, of fibers in particular because um, I think I referred you to a recent article that was in Scientific American and Nature that talked about our, 
our work, the removal of the increasing removal of fiber from our diet has changed the composition of our microbiome in ways that are likely um, to be uh, deleterious to our health. The micro, the bac these bacteria are important for the inactivation of toxic substances um, in food or, or produced by pathogens. They help to degrade them. They help to prevent pathogens from benefiting from resources in the gut by basically a, a space competition. And then they have a tremendous effect on the immune system, and we'll talk a lot about that. So most, the reason we haven't known about these bacteria until recently is that most of them can't be cultured in a laboratory. So the way microbiologists study bacteria, they take them, they put them in a, in a, a culture disk and grow them at 37 degrees in an incubator. But most of the bacteria that live in the gut are highly oxygen sensitive. They don't grow, or we haven't figured out how to grow them in vitro. So we can't get a type strain, and as a result, a lot of them um, don't even have genus and species names because microbiologists won't assign a genus and species name unless they have a type strain that they can put in a freezer and distribute as the type strain of that organism. So that leaves us with learning about these microbes initially through sequencing methods. And we're lucky here at the University of Chicago to have a great relationship with Argonne National Labs, and we're able to have access to the highest uh, sequencing and data management capabilities that are available. And the trick that, that we've used is that these bacteria can have a particular gene in their ribosomal RNA. It's not really necessary to focus on what this gene is, except to know that it's present in all bacterial species and that it has conserved and variable regions. And we can use the conserved re regions to create a primer, so basically a landing point, and then sequence the information between those conserved regions, and that gives us information about phenotype. So this is the method we've used to um, identify the bacteria that are present on our bodies, and it's really revolutionized our understanding. So we now know there's been a, a human microbiome project, and we now know that various body sites have the unique populations of bacteria. So for example, and all of your body sites are populated by bacteria. If you look at the skin, you can actually find that moist parts of the skin have very different bacteria from dry parts of the skin. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is just at the level of bacterial phyla. So I don't know if you remember your classification system from high school biology, but it's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So phylum is one of the higher, broader classifications. So if you just look at this by color, you could see that the bacteria on your hair or in your nostrils are very, very different from the bacteria that live in your colon. And they're characterized by particular phyla. So the, the phyla that mm. I'm going to be talking about most today are the bacteroidetes and the firmicutes. So here's our, our hypothesis. It's what we've hypothesized is that changes in the commensal bacteria you call that a dysbiosis, something that's disturbed the biosis, the healthy state. In a genetically susceptible to individual leads to atopy. So I could substitute here for atopy any of these disease, so-called diseases of Western society. So inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, obesity, um, all of them are, are varying together and are increasing in prevalence. What's atopy, please? Atopy is the tendency towards an allergic response. Okay. So I, I could put in, I've used atopy instead of food allergy to also include asthma, allergic, uh, atopic dermatitis, food allergy, okay. and allergic rhinitis. Okay. So allergic disease. So what are some of these environmental triggers? The biggest one is antibiotics, and you can read fascinating stories um, about the work of Marty Blazer in this Missing Microbes. It's a very readable, uh, popular book. And it's estimated that most kids in the United States have six courses of antibiotics by the time they're two years old, mostly for ear infections that are viral. So to no purpose whatsoever, except to disrupt their microbiome. Not only that, it's become clear that the 
So the, for 50 years, farm, um, pharmaceutical companies have been basically giving the sludge that they can't use to, to sell as commercial uh, antibiotics to farmers, and farmers have known that this subclinical doses of antibiotics make their livestock fat and they've been feeding it to their livestock. It's carried over into our food, it's carried over into our water, and Blazer argues that we've basically done this same experiment to ourselves, and that this subclinical exposure to antibiotics and changes, the resulting changes in the composition of the microbiome, it's what's driving the increasing prevalence of obesity. So antibiotics are clearly the biggest offender actually largely because of um, the dissemination of information provide, provided in this book. A few months ago, the use of antibiotics in livestock was outlawed at subclinical doses, uh, mostly in recognition of, of course, the, the doing this also encourages uh, antibiotic resistant strains and MRSA. So it was stopped on that basis, but it, I think it, the tendency of this kind of exposure to antibiotics to uh, change the composition of the microbiome is equally problematic. Um, the ne next uh, stimulus we'll talk about is diet. So remember that um, these microbiota have co-evolved with us over millennia, and they eat what we eat. The stimulus that they evolved with was not McDonald's. The diet of our ancestors was m no processed foods, low sugar, low fat, high in fiber. And studies have been done comparing children in Africa living in a, in a kind of non-industrial society similar to our Neolithic ancestors, compared their microbiota to children in Europe with a Western style diet, remarkably different. A although at Early on, when both groups of children are breastfeeding, their microbiota is similar, suggesting that it's diet that's made the change. The elimination of previously common enteropathogens, so helminths, worms, um, colonized everyone up to, say, 50 years ago. They're still endemic in the developing world where these kind of diseases are not increasing in prevalence. And they've been eliminated in most of this country. Vaccination reduced exposure to infectious disease. So here I have to be really, really clear. Vaccination is the greatest public health success story in history. Everyone should be vaccinated. But vaccines stimulate our immune system in a different way from getting the infection, right? The infection enters your body via mucosal surface and elicits a characteristic mucosal response, whereas being vaccinated intramuscularly um, in your arm with a, with a protein antigen is going to elicit a different kind of immune response. So make creating vaccines that do more to mimic that mucosal immune response may be helpful. Question? Yes. The increase in these allergies correlates with simple sugars increase in our diets. Yes, so diet, diet clear, besides clearly. Besides just the high fat, which has always been there, but the sugar yes. is almost tracks quite well with this. Yes, so it, it's definitely a, a various components in our diet that are contributing to this. Um, cesarean birth and formula feeding, and I want to talk to you more about that because that's related to what we study. Before you leave the, the thing about parasitic worms, the implication there almost is that the parasites are conferring some sort of benefit to us? Yes, so um, in earlier mouse model work we did and now in clinical trials, um, the parasites have, have occupied, they're able to occupy a niche when they live, when you're chronically infected with them, where they stay, they, they stay in residence and they do relatively little harm and they do that by creating an immunosuppression and there are studies ongoing where um, worms are actually being given to people with inflammatory bowel disease to try to turn off the intestinal inflammation and restore the the previous homeostasis but the problem is that the kind of worm that they've given in these clinical trials is derived from, so they, they're not going to, they don't want to give someone an infection with a human parasite. So they've given them a worm derived from pigs. 
and it's not colonizing and it's not eliciting the same response as an active infection, so it's not as immunomodulatory as the worms would be. But these are all of the kind of things that are being tried, first experimentally by scientists in the lab and then, and then moved into clinical trials. So we're all sterile before we're born, and in the co-evolved strategy, we're colonized with our initial microbiota by passage through the vaginal canal, which is prominently colonized with lactobacilli. Lactobacilli are the yogurt bacteria. Babies that are born by cesarean section, instead, their founder bacteria are derived from the skin of their mother or their caregiver. And this can actually be mapped to exactly whose skin the bacteria came from. So that means that babies that are born by C-section um, start off at a disadvantage in terms of their founder population. And that carries out for, for some time. They C-section birth is linked to a higher risk of allergic disease, higher susceptibility to pathogens. And in fact, one of the points in Blazer's book, they're suggesting that, and some hospitals have started to do this, is one of the ways to counteract this is to take a, a vaginal, for C-section births, take a vaginal swab from, from the child's mother and try to inoculate their mouth, the baby's mouth as a way of introducing those bacteria that they would have received from the vaginal tract. So all of our work has focused on this neonatal period. This is where, this is the best opportunity for us to interrupt this process. This is where food allergies appear, and this is where the microbiota is changing and stabilizing until over time, each of us has a distinct individualized differentiated microbiota which becomes harder to change. So there's no treatment currently for food allergy, only allergen avoidance, but you may have seen um, this report a couple of years ago in the, the New York Times which I personally thought was a little bit below their usual standard of, of reporting because it was a, too much in the way of, of cheerleading for this, for this one uh, intervention. Uh, I heard uh, not too long ago about a, a mutation responsible, principally responsible for this acute peanut allergy. Is, uh, is this true? I mean, is this pan out that a, a mutation? So, if, wow, if, if, if you're referring to what I think you're referring to, is this is a collaborator of mine who did have a paper, a uh, genome-wide association study that linked a particular uh, MHC haplotype to peanut allergy. Yes, so specifically to peanut allergy. It's just a first study and with a limited set of patients, so we don't know yet. So what a lot of us are very interested in is looking at the intersection between genetics and the environment. And that's where we're going to find the answers about what's, so how the environment is impacting genetics. Environment can, can cause epigenetic changes, changing in, in the heritability, and also um, how the environment is influencing the composition of the microbiome. So there's a lot of different ways we can come at finding. It's not going to be a simple genetic answer. And uh, all of those different environmental exposures I presented to you probably all work in concert and on a society level as opposed to an individual level. So I don't expect to see a one-to-one -one correlation between cesarean birth and that every child born by cesarean section is going to develop a food allergy. I, so I'm talking mostly about exposures at the level of the population. So in this story, they were talking about oral immunotherapy, and that's the only um, treatment we have so far, and it's based on offering to children with particularly peanut allergies, very, very severe peanut allergies, very small doses of the allergen over a certain period of time, and then slowly en escalating the dose in a, a way that causes them to become desensitized. And it works to an extent, but the problem is that it's usually done in, in kids that are, you know, around uh, preteens. And they believe that they're, they, they do become transiently desensitized, but they don't become tolerant. They don't, 
they're still alert, they still have the capability for, uh, for responding to, uh, with an allergic response. So the way that the desensitization is maintained in these protocols is by giving them a dose of the allergen every single day in a certain exact amount. So the 13-year-olds follow this very nicely, but once they go off to college and stop having, you know, mom supervising that protocol, that's where they become really at risk because they believe that they're no longer allergic, they stop taking the dosing regimen, and then they're at risk for a life-threatening response. So this by itself is not going to work. And it all, I'm going to argue to you that, that this, that the commensal microbiome has a, an essential role in inducing tolerance to dietary antigens, and this protocol doesn't take into consideration that role. So what we want to do is develop new kinds of bacteria-based live biotherapeutic drugs that can work together with oral immunotherapy to prevent or treat food allergy. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about. So the question when we started was, does the commensal microbiota regulate allergic responses to food? And can we develop novel strategies to modulate its composition to prevent or treat food allergy? So I call this slide Mucosal Immunology 101. Go ahead. Um, it seems like every time one has a bad diarrhea, you uh, end up losing your commensural uh, um, microbiota. Uh, so how come my allergies don't change uh, when I have So, there? yeah, so you don't. The, so the bacteria, there are some bacteria that are, well, let me back up. So we have a mucus layer here, and there are some bacteria that are closely associated with the mucus. So those um, don't pass through in the feces. And these bacteria are multiplying in, in an enormous frequency. There's, there are so many of them, trillions of them, that you don't lose them in any significant, um, really significant numbers by a bout of diarrhea. You do cause, usually it's associated with damage to the epithelium, and that may be a problem, but they're constantly replenishing themselves. So you definitely, you can change the composition of the microbiota depending on what elicited the diarrhea. So, for example, Clostridium difficile is a common hospital-based infection that um, is a problem in patients who've had a uh, uh, large doses of antibiotics. It's C. difficile colitis can be life-threatening. And that's the, he actually here at the University of Chicago, that's the test case, that's the situation in which fecal transplant from a healthy individual has a 99% cure rate. So what happens in those patients is that the C. difficile uh, bacteria takes over and occupies all of the space, continues to prolong the diarrhea or epithelial damage, and introducing whole fecal material from a healthy individual blocks that response, restores health. So that's the kind of proof of principle that this approach can work, but of course um, there's not a lot of people lining up to have fecal transplants. So that, that's not the way we want to do it. So um, this is what you need to know about mucosal immunology to understand the rest of this talk, and I, I think it's, it's, we can look at it in a pretty simple way. So if you cons consider that the GI tract is a tube, and there are, are bacteria that are very close to the surface of the GI tract, and then there are those that are deep in the tube. Those that are very deep in the middle are not the ones that are, are so interesting to us because they probably can't interact with the immune system. We're interested in the ones that are associated with the mucus. So mucus, um, all of your, the body surfaces that contact with the outside world are covered in mucus. You all know what it is. And it forms a physical barrier that, to which bacteria can adhere, which also provides some nutrition for the bacteria. And in this mucus, there are natural antibiotics. So there are antimicrobial peptides called Reg3 beta and Reg3 beta gamma that are synthesized by epithelial cells and secreted into the mucus to help to protect it from being damaged by any pathogens that come along. A specialized kind of antibody, and, and I think um, Alan, his beautiful glossary described antibodies to you. Um, in fact, I didn't know what that antigen 
see, I learned something there. Um, a special kind that are adapted to live in the harsh environment of the gut. Because remember, the gut has, the stomach has a very low pH that's denaturing. There's a lot of proteolytic enzymes. So this is kind of a fortified antibody that makes it resistant to all of those degradative processes. And then it's hard to imagine that all of these bacteria and other microbes and foods are kept out of the rest of our body by a single cell layered epithelium. And it has to seal the, the, the junctions at the top of these cells to make it um, pretty much impermeant in most situations. So things should not be able to get into your circulation. But I'm going to show you that, that they do in, in some situations. So just bear with me for a little bit of data, because from what I've heard, this is a very sophisticated audience, and, and you're going to be able to understand it. But if not, take a nap for a minute. So this is, this is the se kind of sequencing data we work with. And all I'm showing you, if you just look at the colors, I'm showing you the abundance of different groups of bacteria. I'm showing you some of them at the phylum level. Some of them I've gone down to the family level. And all I want you to appreciate here is not treated with antibiotics, treated with antibiotics. Feces, ileal contents, the small intestine, not treated, treated. Huge, huge, huge difference. This is what happens to the numbers of bacteria. So we start treating them with antibiotics neonatally to mi mimic what would happen um, in, the er in early life. So we give the antibiotics by gavage before weaning, and then after weaning, we put it in the drinking water. We reduce the total number of bacteria present in the gut of these mice by two logs. And now we see an allergic sensitization, so a peanut-specific IgE and IgG1 response to food that we don't see at all in the untreated mice or in control mice that only get the adjuvant, something that, that elicits an immune response um, but not the peanut allergen. So antibiotic treatment changes the composition of bacteria and elicits allergic sensitization to food. So how then can we go from this, considering that this is such a wipeout, to find out which bacteria mediate protection? So we're lucky that here at the University of Chicago, we have a state-of-the-art facility for working with germ-free mice. So we have mice that uh, have no bacterial colonization at all, that are maintained in these special bubbles. They're never exposed to the outside world. These are actually heavy gloves. See, those are the fingers of the gloves, and you can only touch the mice by putting your hands through these gloves. Everything that comes in and out of this chamber has to pass through a port where it's carefully decontaminated. And it's a very sophisticated facility. There are actually um, very few like it in the world and, and or in this country. And we've been able to manipulate the mice, use, you know, even though it's very cumbersome with these kind of gloves, and develop a model of food allergy in mice that have no bacteria at all, and then in mice into which we've, we've introduced particular bacteria that we're interested in. So how did we decide? One problem with doing these kind of experiments is that most of these bacteria can't be cultured. So we can't say, OK, I want to study you know, this particular group, because there's no way to isolate that group. So we had to work right now with what we can get access to. So we Why is this that you can't culture? Because we don't know how. Because they're obligate anaerobes. They, um, as soon as they get exposed to oxygen, they die. And the, what, we don't know exactly what they live on in that environment. So we're getting some success. The exposure to oxygen is a huge problem. But an even bigger problem is we don't know what they need to live. So as we get more information about their genet the genetic composition of these um, bacteria, we'll learn more about what we need to give them to, to allow them to grow in vitro. So, we divided this whole world of bacteria into the bacteria that I told you about that tend to reside with the digested food, so those that are deep in the lumen that we don't expect to interact with the immune system, and then those that are associated with the mucosa. So these are called Bacteroides and Clostridia.
And when we did that, we saw that as I've, um, as the hypothesis I've been explaining to you predicts, germ-free mice have far and away the highest allergic sensitization to food. This is, so you see the break in scale, this is comparing the mice with no bacteria at all to mice in our regular colony that have a normal composition of bacteria. They, we don't, can't get an allergic response in them. If we take the, the fecal material from these mice, put it into these mice, we block the allergic response. If we take these Clostridia bacteria, we block the allergic response, but not with these Bacteroides bacteria. So what we found that the Clostridia are able to do is elicit a cytokine called IL-22, and I'll explain that in the very next slide. I just want to show you here, these bacteria do it. This is the germ-free mice, these bacteria don't. And we know the pathway that elicits IL-22 and IL-22 was interesting to us because it's known from the literature that it regulates the proliferation of the epithelium, it regulates the production of mucus, and it regulates the production of those antimicrobial peptides, the natural antibiotics. So it's a really important cytokine for guarding the barrier, for keeping the barrier intact, for making sure that it remains impermeable. So we wanted to know then how does our, do the clostridia do something that, that helps to regulate the, bac the barrier through the production of IL-22? So I think we came up with a, a, a clever way to do that. So we took, I told you that peanut exposure is, is very problematic for kids with allergies and uh, companies have developed very, very sensitive assays to detect small amounts of peanut in environmental situations. So peanut, its scientific name is Arrakis hypogea, and it's a seed, and it's almost entirely made of proteins called ARAH1 to 11. ARAH6 and ARAH2 are the dominant food allergens, and a company had available a very, very sensitive assay to detect these allergens in the environment. So we applied this assay to blood from our mice to see would it work to detect these allergens in the blood. And we did this in mice that are antibiotic treated because I showed you that really messes up their microbiota. And this is what we find. So first, it was already known from an old literature that after we eat, you can transiently detect some food in the bloodstream. And that's shown here, that's the black line, NT. If we treat mice with antibiotics, look at this, there's a lot more of this peanut allergen in the bloodstream and it doesn't come to baseline, it keeps rising. If we uh, give clostridia, these bacteria um, that I'm telling you are immunoregulatory to antibiotic treated mice, now we don't see allergen in the bloodstream. If we give them IL-22, we don't see allergen in the bloodstream. If we take the mice that are antibiotic treated, colonized with clostridia, and block the clostridia's ability to make IL-22, we now see allergen comes back into the bloodstream. So this is all showing us a cycle that this, these mucosa associated bacteria are inducing the production of IL-22 and that's regulating the barrier. And that's just shown in this schematic here. So this was the existing paradigm of how tolerance to antigen is maintained and it was all based on antigen specific responses, that you get antigen specific regulatory T cells. But I'm telling you about a generational change that's related to the composition of the microbiota. How would that change the antigen-specific response? So what I'm arguing and why oral immunotherapy by itself can't work is that there are populations of bacteria, and we've identified one of them as these clostridia, that can elicit IL-22 production by certain cells in the gut that regulate access of allergen into the bloodstream and induce these natural antibiotics, mucus, and proliferation to make a barrier and protective response. So what does this have to do with um, food allergy? Well, it's now research is, as epidemiological research is showing that mothers and offspring's use of antibiotics is linked to cow's milk allergy. Um, if you look in the urine of kids with food allergy, 
They have high levels of triclosan. You know the antibacterial agent that's present in the antibacterial soaps? That is actually present in, in many more products than you um, realize, including toothpaste. And, and that's definitely another one of the big negatives, all of these antimicrobials. And you can find that in higher concentrations in the urine of kids with food allergy. One of the things that drove the increasing prevalence of, of food allergy was the American Academy of Pediatrics. So when the, when the prevalence started to rise, um, the Academy said, okay, you should not, um, you should not introduce food allergen or peanuts to children at a young age. Withhold peanuts. Pregnant women shouldn't eat peanuts. Don't give kids peanuts until they're four years old. Well, this study that you may have seen that just came out in February showed that that was completely the wrong thing to do. And this was based on a researcher who was traveling between Israel and London, and he noticed that a group of, of people that were migrating between these two sites, in Israel it's common to feed young children something called bamba, which is a soft peanut product. And kids in Israel had very low prevalence of peanut allergy, whereas the same genetically related kids in London had very high prevalence of allergy. So he looked at the age and introduction of, solid f of peanuts, and he showed that early introduction of peanut-based products prevents peanut allergy in high-risk infants. He showed it very clearly. It's a very large, well-studied cohort. He studied it over five years. So um, this kind of alarmist response by the Academy of Pediatrics actually accelerated the, the, uh, uh, the increasing prevalence of, of food allergy, and now we know that this is one thing we can do to, to start to bring it down again, not withhold peanuts and not withhold allergens <coughs> from high-risk infants. But what we want to do is develop a, a, pro, a new kind of probiotics. So what you see in the grocery store as probiotics, um, it's mostly a money-making enterprise. They, they, there's very little to show that, that any of these work, particularly in adults. The only research that shows that probiotics have an effect is when given to infants and added to, to formula. All the probiotics currently on the market are lactobacillus-based, yogurt-type bacteria. So if you, if you are prescribed a course of antibiotics, you know, a broad-spectrum antibiotic, would you be drinking uh, kefir or yogurt or one of these uh, probiotic kind of things? So, yes, so the question was um, if you're prescribed a, a course of antibiotics, would it be helpful to, to drink kefir or, or um, yogurt? yogurt? Or so it might make you feel better. I, I, there's no evidence that that tiny amount of bacteria that's present in the kefir is going to do anything to modulate the trillions of bacteria that are already um, present in your G GI tract, regardless of what, what Whole Foods will claim. Um, but we did a study where we looked at, at daily, uh, so administration of, of lactobacilli in infant formula, and we can see an effect there. So we teamed up with an, with an Italian group, and I think this was uh, through our interactions with Stefano Guandolini, he introduced us to his colleagues in Naples, and this turned out, I think, to be very beneficial because an Italian clinic is very different from um, an American clinic. So there's no diversity in this clinic. The kids are all Italian. Uh, they're probably all Neapolitan. They likely have a similar uh, diet culturally influ influenced. So that helped to make the patient population a little more uniform, and I think it assisted our study. So what he was doing was trying to look at a uh, what was the best kind of formula to give with cow's milk allergy? And what he found was that children that were treated with a, a, an extensively hydrolyzed casein formula, so casein is one of the milk antigens, supplemented with lactobacillus GG, w had a much more successful acquisition of tolerance than any of the, f of the other formulas he looked at. So he gave us samples from kids in this cohort. And what we found is that the microbiome of the allergic kids, so these kids are only four months old, but already they're very, very different from the healthy kids. They're a much, much more diverse, and they're skewed towards 
So here, just look at the colors again. You can see that this is healthy. So this is the abundance of this particular group in the healthy kids. This is the abundance in the allergic kids. I mean, you can appreciate how different these two graphs are. So already at four months old, their microbiotas are radically different. So what can we do to change that? Well, we found out that when we treated these allergic children with the probiotic supplemented formula, we saw increased amounts of butyrate, which is a product of the digestion of dietary fiber in their feces. So this gives us a clue that we can approach for treatment. So what we're doing now, which I think is kind of cool, is we're taking the um, fecal material from the healthy infants and from the allergic infants and putting them into mice and then setting up our allergy model. And the prediction is that the, healthy, the mice that receive the healthy fecal material won't become allergic, they're protected, and the mice that receive the allergic fecal material will, and then this gives us a preclinical model into which we can introduce their various um, interventions. So various bacterial populations, um, the things that we want to test, and in fact, um, a lot of biotech companies are working on this. So I told you fecal transplant is the proof of principle, but not very desirable. But you can look at this kind of approach at the level of groups of bacteria, including the clostridium that I've shown you um, make these short chain fatty acids that are associated with health or other populations of bacteria. You can look at a consortium of a defined group of bacteria or if you can identify a particular bioactive products. So you, if you might have heard that um, the one group that initially identified 17 different strains of clostridia that induce Tregs in the gut has created a company called Vedanta and Boston that just sold that technology to Johnson & Johnson for $241 million to develop a drug to treat inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, we have a, a question from someone on the webinar uh, kind of related to this. Uh, someone wanted to know, does Dr. Nagler have a view on the impact which companies such as Symbiotic Health may have if they successfully commercialize capsules from the process, fecal matter, for healthy patients? So the question is, do I have an opinion on the impact that these kind of companies can have if they're able to commercialize um, these kind of products. Yes, I think they can be enormously impactful. And we're working not with that company, but we're working with two other companies that have products that are, are related to the, yeah, that's the next slide. So one of the bacterial populations that we found particularly modulated in the treated allergic children was Roseburia. And in fact, there's a company that has um, a form of Roseburia that they are now in clinical trials for inflammatory bowel disease. Vedanta, as I mentioned, has a, a consortium of clostridia that has a lot of similarities to our mouse consortium that's in, um, that they're trying to move into clinical trials in inflammatory bowel disease. Another approach that we're working on is to identify these fibers. They can be called prebiotics that are the substrate for these bacteria so that we can let the bacteria produce their own metabolites by giving them their fibers that we've eliminated from our diet. And we can set up mouse models for that. And then the third approach is to take metabolites that we can identify like butyrate and encapsulate them into specialized nanoparticles that will be degraded at very various parts of the gut. So for example, that are pH sensitive, that will uh, that will target them to the small intestine or to the large intestine. And you probably heard we have this fantastic new institute for molecular engineering and collaborators there that are very interested in working on that. So you're saying that the metabolites are not just a marker then, that the, the metabolites themselves are actually biologically active? Yes, yes, yes. I, they're, they're also a marker, um, but that they're biologically so I neglected to tell you that, that the short chain fatty acids are the energy source for the intestinal epithelial cells. That that's their main, uh, main source of nutrition that helps those cells re remain metabolically healthy. So it's not just that, that they're a marker for populations of bacteria in the gut, they're biologically important. If the 
close to the very bacteria that create a substrate that supports and sustains the epithelial cells. That blocks out the protein, the antigen, from entering the bloodstream and then sensitizing the mast cells. Now, excellent. People <laughs> during antibiotics and the incidents, as you said, of six certain episodes of antibiotics, then there's going to be leakage of, say, the peanut antigen. Uh, how much do you have to have a leakage to create the allergic response? Uh, and once it's set off, does it, you indicate you can't change it. So what you're really saying is we're going to, we're going to give a better barrier. But uh, how much leakage do you have? And what do we mean by desensitization? Yeah, so we don't know exactly the answer to that question. Obviously, um, and as Blazer also argues very, very emphatically, stopping uh, giving kids antibiotics for ear, viral ear infections, that's a no-brainer. We, we have to stop doing that. Um, we, don't, we don't know exactly. That's actually a, a very, very sophisticated question, exactly how much... Um, what the threshold is for for how much allergen in the bloodstream, how long, and that's that's one of the foundations of our work going forward. So we don't know the answer to that question, but that's exactly what we want to know. And I don't say that we can't. We want to reduce the permeability, but I don't. I don't believe it's true that we can't turn the response off um, entirely. We have our best chance if we intervene in childhood, but I I have hope that we can do it in adults too. I mean, well, there are other kinds of uh, allergists are kind of do all sorts of tests on people and they talk about desensitizing, which are not things I suppose are necessarily associated through the gut. How does that desensitization? So the only strategies, there are some strategies based on desensitization through the skin, which actually have some positive results and desensitization th through oral administration. So the, what distinguishes sensitization from, so in mice and in humans, s sensitization, skin prick responses don't correlate with symptoms. So now we have new models in the mice where we can actually measure allergic symptoms, meaning mast cell degranulation, um, anaphylactic responses. Sensitization doesn't necessarily, some people have high levels of IgE in their blood and no allergic responses. Some people have low levels of IgE and massive allergic responses. Those, those two don't absolutely correlate with each other. And that's a problem with using those skin tests as a proxy for saying that someone is allergic or not allergic. Uh, what's so undesirable about fecal transplants apart from the aesthetic <laughs> considerations? Um, well, because we don't, we don't know what's in there, right? So if a fecal transplant from mother to child, I would have no problem with that at all because that, that child should have everything that was in the fecal microbiome of the mother anyway. But from somebody else, uh, look at all we've discovered. How do we know that there's not pathogens in there that that could actually create more of a problem than, it, it's just too much of an unknown. But in a life-threatening case like C. difficile colitis, it, it may be the best option that we have available. But I think it, it's just too poorly characterized to feel that, it, that it's safe. And then of course we have to pass regular to all of this, um, how all of this is going to be dealt with by the FDA in the regulatory world is completely unknown. And a fecal transplant is just too, um, too mysterious a, an entity to really use it as, as certainly as a treatment for food allergy. Okay. Um, in terms of what we know now and can do now, uh, what of these products, uh, substances can be used to build up the uh, my, uh, mucosal uh, cells to avoid or irritable bowel syndrome? Fiber. fiber, high fiber diet is definitely beneficial. There's and the oh, so the oh, what can we do now? So we have we're working as I told you to, to in preclinical studies to see whether these bacterial populations that I've described to you are protect against allergy in preclinical models. 
with the intention of taking the, the positives into clinical trials. But what can we do now? Um, we talked about not using antibiotics when they're not indicated, uh, reducing all those antibacterial soaps, um, which are also uh, now t winding up, to have a lot of effects on depleting uh, helpful bacterial populations, and increasing dietary fiber. That clearly uh, is beneficial for this population of bacteria and may wind up being one of the most beneficial things that we can do. I have a question. You said high fiber diet. The Eskimo used to have a diet that had almost all meat, essentially. Do they have allergies? See, I, I have not heard anybody talking about Eskimos. I can tell you that I know a study of um, children in Africa where they had a very high fiber diet and, and there was no allergies in that yes, population. The other extreme, at least the classic ones, whether there are any left, I don't know. Yeah, I, I haven't seen a study about that, but that would be interesting to know. I was interested, you talk about soaps and antibiotics, there's topical antibiotics, typically ear drops, antibiotics, <coughs> but that's topical, it's not systemic. Uh, and most of what you're talking about here is systemic. Uh, so I just was at a meeting where somebody uh, was showing me um, all of the different products that contain triclosan, which I was amazed at. It's, it's in, in virtually everything. It's in toothpaste. It's in, in shampoos. It's, in, there, it's even impregnated into plastic to make antibacterial. So I noticed in the telephone in my hotel was an antibacterial telephone in the bathroom. It's impregnated with triclosan. And she showed me data that showed that this, even though you think of the skin as, as impermeant, she can find that in, in the bloodstream. So it's, it's not, um, these topical exposures are not as benign as we think. But well, isn't the exterior skin exteriorly even tighter? Yeah, well it could be because there's a lot of, of, of hand to mouth, as well this is from mouse models, the mice groom each other so anything that's exterior it winds up being groomed and I think that's also true with, with children at least, there's a lot of, of, of hand to mouth behavior so uh, topical things can wind up having a, a more of an effect than we appreciate. I was just curious about the type of fiber, you mentioned high fiber being good but does it matter whether it's nutritional fiber like you get from say beans or oatmeal versus uh, metamucil type uh, uh, so that's ex fiber. that's exactly what we want to know for the clostridia and that's why we're working with that carbohydrate biochemist to find exactly which kind of fibers expand this back so the idea is to give people fiber and and do the job that way. Instead of giving them repeated doses of bacteria, let the bacteria expand in vivo by giving them their substrate and then allow them to make more of that, those uh, metabolites. So we don't know exactly yet, but that's something we're trying in the mouse models, different, um, different kinds of fibers that this carbohydrate chemist is making to see which one works best. Another question from the webinar that, that I think you talked about earlier. Um, has there been any research on chemicalization of food supply contributing to increase in food allergies? So the question is, um, is the chemicalization of the food supply uh, contributing to uh, food allergies? I think there are some people that are concerned about genetically modified foods. Um, I guess that's what the, the caller means by chemicalization. I personally don't think that that's contributing to the increase in food allergies. The studies of the allergens, as I told you from the very beginning, has not identified anything about their biochemical structure, with the exception that one thing we're noticing for peanuts and for or also the milk allergens um, that we find very curious is that the, the assay that we use de detects proteins that have maintained their secondary structure, that have not been broken down. So why is peanut going through the low pH of the, of the stomach, all the digestive enzymes of the small intestine, and still winding up in the blood in an intact form? So we see the same thing with one of the milk allergens. So we're wondering if maybe what makes a food allergen a food allergen is its ability to resist degradation. Wheat also has that property. And we'd like to make the same kind of assays for all of those different allergens to explore that. So we think that that may be one of the things that makes a food allergen, a food allergen is its ability to resist degradation. 
we can uh, how can we keep going uh, webinar people is it okay with you guys yeah okay in terms of advice for folks of a certain age already <laughs> uh, you said uh, more fiber I think you said don't get wound up too much on yogurt well I think I think that just the idea that um, people believe that yogurt has the health benefits that are claimed are, are just are just not supported by scientific data. I mean, it's that's it's that simple. They probably do make you feel better, but it's not because they're changing the bacterial populations in your gut. Any other things that our old folks should do besides fiber? <laughs> um, sugar in the fat. <laughs> Avoid sugar. Yeah. Avoid fat. Yes, probably. Avoid it. Just kind of drink olive oil. <laughs> We live in a kind of gluten-free revolution. How do you fit that in? So, uh, so there are wheat allergies, and of course celiac disease is a different kind of response, an inflammatory response to wheat. So bread and gluten have been in our diets for 10,000 years. Um, it, the increasing prevalence in these diseases is within the last 20. So I don't think, I think a lot of this gluten-free diet is, is a, a tremendous overreaction. And especially the link between gluten-free diet and autism, I don't believe that at all. So I, I don't think that there's anything inherently harmful about gluten. From earlier you said diarrhea had a minimal effect on the gut. What about a full purge like most of us have had for <coughs> Um, I think the, the bacterial populations will come back very, very quickly. So that it's very transient. And that those kind of purges are, are really to, to just to improve the vision of, uh, improve the ability of the gastroenterologist to be able to visualize the surface of your gut. The, the bacterial populations that are mucosa associated will still come back quickly. And I've never heard anybody complain of, of a failure to restore the composition of the microbiota after a colonoscopy. One more for the, from the webinar. She says, wow, so based on this research, do you have an idea of when you may have a viable medicine for a multi-food allergic child, including all nuts, peanuts, and sesame? So the, <laughs> so the caller says, um, based on this research, do I know when I'll, I will have a viable medicine for multiple food allergic children? And um, I get that email almost every day. And so, no, we don't know. Because first we have to do the preclinical studies, find the right bacterial populations, and then there's all of the hurdles into passing regulatory uh, parameters and then developing it as a product. What I'm hoping is that a lot of that regulatory work will be done by the IBD researchers and taking the drugs first into IBD and that we could come along as a second indication in food allergy. So if we're lucky, maybe four years down the road, five years down the road is, is a best case scenario. How do you understand why the milk allergy goes away? It's the theory that... that yeah, so that, that's very curious, why some of them resolve on their own and why um, why others don't. We don't know. I think they're probably two different kinds of diseases and that it's, it's a much, so milk allergy typically presents as a much milder sort of allergic response. It doesn't elicit anaphylaxis. Um, one peculiar thing about this Italian cohort and the high incidence of food allergy, for some reason breastfeeding is very unpopular in Italy. So most of these kids were breastfed for a maximum of two weeks. So and that cl uh, clearly, uh, you're not going to get allergic to cow's milk if you don't, you're not fed cow's milk. So uh, uh, prolonging breastfeeding would be one easy way to, to reduce the incidence of cow's milk allergy in this particular population. There's growing concern about the feeding of antibiotics to uh, livestock and the development of new species of bacteria. Could that be a contributing factor? Yes, yes. So um, I, I mentioned earlier that that actually was just, regulation was just passed to outlaw the f um, feeding of 
uh, antibiotics to livestock, mostly for concerns about antibiotic resistant strains, but it applies here too for changes because a lot of those, some of these antibiotics are very, very stable. We actually did an experiment like that by mistake in our mouse colony. We used some mice that had been, some mothers that had been antibiotic treated um, in a different experiment and found that a whole bunch of bacteria were dropped out in their progeny. And then we realized that um, mice have to eat their own poop and that the b antibiotics were stable in the poop. They were consumed again and then they deleted the bacterial populations in the progeny. So some of them are very, very stable in the environment. Uh, are you saying that the adult microbiota is pretty stable and basically you can't do that much to Yes, so it's much more stable, and that's going to be a much bigger challenge. How, how to, because these bacteria, which I haven't emphasized enough, form like a living community. They're all interacting with each other, and we don't, we don't even begin to understand how they're producing things. One bacterial group is producing things that another bacterial group needs as its food source. They're a, a dynamic community, so we're going to have to figure out how to model them in three dimensions in, vi in vitro, and then how to restore that living population. So I think that that's all a challenge going forward in the future. I just read an article in the latest issue of Smithsonian Magazine about the use of a supercomputer at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. It takes in, uh, input information about the type of cancer a patient has and searches a vast database to look at alternative uh, treatment options and come up with uh, results that are an aid to the physician in choosing a treatment option. And I wonder if something like that would be, could, has potential for other areas like allergies. So in terms, in terms of the microbiome, we'd love to get to that point where we could have individualized treatment. But the problem so far is that um, when you take a sample at a particular point in time, and this has just become clear, very clear in the last year, what you're really measuring in that sample is what that person ate that day. Because the microbiota changes on a daily basis in response to what you eat. So that means if you want to say the microbiota from person X is related or not to food allergy, you need multiple um, longitudinal samples from that person to see whether that particular bacterial population that you're, is either increased or decreased is stably increased to decrease and is not just changing in response to food. So there's a lot of challenges. There's the mucosa associated bacteria may not be well represented in fecal material. So there's a lot of challenges to understanding um, the microbiota and disease on an individual basis. The best data we have so far comes from biopsy samples, especially in IBD. But for food allergy, we don't have any biopsies because you can only take biopsies if they're diagnostic. You can't take biopsies just for research purposes. So, um, so we don't have that information. Well, this has been a really, oh, go ahead. What makes the microbiome an organ? Um, I, th I, I don't know if I would necessarily call it an organ. You can think of it as an organ in the sense that I was always saying it's, it's a, a living structure of multiple different parts that are all interacting with each other. So you have to think of these bacterial species as not living in isolation, although we've studied them in isolation because we have to take a reductionist approach, but they're all interacting e with each other in the way that, for example, the different cells of your, of your heart do. So that, that's the motivation for calling it an organ, is that you have to think of, of it as a, a collection of parts that interact together to have a f an effect collectively. So I think this area is, is fascinating, and the gut biome in particular, because many of us as we get older have these problems. But are there people who are working in particular, let's say, on skin microbiota, or uh, you know, so is there is there a group like yours that's doing uh, research in different areas? Just yes, there's a gr there's a great group that's working on the skin microbiome, and I know that literature because um, atopic dermatitis 
is a risk factor for food allergy. And people are studying actually the particular populations of the skin. So one idea is that, when you, that one of the ways you initially get sensitized to food allergens is via your skin. And kids that have allergic dermatitis have breaks in the barrier. And they also have, some have genetic susceptibility to a defective barrier. And that's associated actually with staphylococcal infection. So people are studying how staph infection on the skin in atopic dermatitis changes the barrier in a way that predisposes to sensitization and how it changes the other bacterial populations on the skin. So the skin is actually a very interesting site. I mentioned earlier that there are, uh, there's a skin microbiota of moist skin that's very different from the microbiota of dry skin. So, and it's also very easy to access. Right? You can easily take samples from anywhere on the skin, whereas other parts of the body are, are more tricky. Thank you. Is anybody trying to build a um, artificial microbiome that has oxygen closed off from it, but uh, other ingredients, uh, foodstuffs coming into it to see if you can get a little bit more control over this? Uh? Yeah, peop a lot of people are trying to culture um, different populations of bacteria in, in in combination and in, in isolation. We're not doing a lot of that kind of work because I'm more interested in animal model work and I come from a animal model immunology background, not from a microbiology background. But I think there are a lot of people and we hope we can work with them to get the to find out what they learn and apply it to our models. Well, this has been uh, maybe one of the best audiences I've ever spoken to. Really great questions, and it's really been delightful to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.